Tonight, we put a human face on an epidemic. Parents who lost a child to heroin overdose open up to us and pay their respects to the son they lost. Then we pivot to politics and look at the latest from Capitol Hill with a reporter from the Washington Post, budget battles, the ongoing tax fight, and a whole lot more. Also, legendary theater critic John Simon joins us with his review of the new hit play, The Band's Visit. Good evening, everyone, and welcome to RFL. I'm Richard French. Thank you for joining us this Friday evening. In a few minutes, we will take a look at the latest from Washington, but we begin tonight with the opioid epidemic. It's a story we've covered extensively on this program. It is a crisis that is tearing families apart throughout our region and this country. Now, those struggles, they're coming to light in a different way, in obituaries. That could help to erase some of the stigma surrounding addiction, now, even though it will never ease the pain. Fios One and the Journal News, they have worked together to tell a very personal story. Here's Fios One's Ray Ramundi. It says Peter K. Ballesty, beloved son and brother, lost his battle with the disease of addiction Saturday morning at his soul in Congress. Diane Ballesty reading those penned words from her son Peter's obituary. Peter losing his life to a heroin overdose four years ago. His parents among the first to publicly share their son's story, mentioning addiction in this very personal way. Diane felt this way, as did I, that we should be open about the way he died. And it was a drug overdose. There are no words to express the pain of those he leaves behind. The Ballesty family accidentally launching an unprecedented awareness campaign, which has helped erase the major stigma for those who have succumbed to addiction. The discovery uncovered by Journal News health investigative reporter Dave Robinson. Uh, the online database, uh, uh, Legacy.com, and uh, we, we went from there and looked back to the uh, kind of origins of, of who was the first to mention it, and then we came up with uh, the, the Ballesty family. Four years later, conducting a search on the online obituary database, Legacy.com, there were 145 hits mentioning addiction in obituaries across New York State more than a hundred of people who are saying, you know, this is a real problem out there in the community. So, I mean, that's a big jump in just four years. You know? where, did, where did you pull this out of, Susan? <laughs> and taking notice of those obituaries is the team here at the Council of Addiction Prevention and Education, known as CAPE in Dutchess County. It makes me hopeful and it makes me want to to celebrate the courage that these families have. And the organization itself has been mentioned in obituaries without solicitation by families who worked with CAPE and lost loved ones to the disease. What we're seeing is those families are taking their grief and working through that grief in a way to pr find prevention, treatment, and recovery for this disease. There's no question that the overdose epidemic is everywhere, but particularly here in Dutchess County, according to the medical examiner's office, the number of accidental overdose deaths have more than doubled since 2010. And now with the influx and accessibility to opioid drugs and medications, the need for families to be publicly open about addiction is needed more than ever. This epidemic has forced changes in every corner of our society because it is so overwhelming. This has to come out. It has to be open. The book has to be read, you know, and if it's not, it will stay under the table. It will stay hidden in the dark alleys. The Ballesty family, along with many others here in the Hudson Valley, looking to reverse the tide and demand more acceptance and resources for those struggling with addiction. There are no words to express the pain of those he leaves behind. Result. And Pete's family finding peace by increasing awareness of his disease through his obituary, ending the silence associated with addiction to encourage other families to talk openly about it and to get help. Ray Ray Mundy, Fios One News. And to read the entire piece, uh, I encourage you to visit lowhud.com right now. Dave Robinson's full story will appear this Sunday in the Journal News. Now, trust me, if there's one thing I believe you'll remember from tonight's program, it will be the words um, of Ms. Ballesty uh, talking about her son, and I'll have that for you in a few minutes here. We'll play the entire obituary that she so courageously uh, shares with us. But first, for more context on this story, let's bring in Journal News health reporter David Robinson um, with more on this crisis. When you first did this story and then in the subsequent 
um, investigations into how much more common and prevalent it is, um, it breaks your heart. But at the same time, we're finally starting to see a veil building pulled back here, uh, where it doesn't have to be shrouded um, in secrecy anymore. We know the numbers are damning in terms of the epidemic um, of drug abuse, but now I, people are starting to feel much more liberated that there's not uh, an addiction shame when they're remembering a loved one. That's right. Um, uh, really, this is one of those kind of crucial steps in uh, uh, curbing the opioid epidemic. When you talk to the uh, treatment experts, they, they'll tell you that um, the idea of addressing the stigma is really the, the key turning point really in the idea of getting people to go and get the treatment that they need you know that's what they'll say when the people come in finally they'll say I, I put it off for so long because of the embarrassment the guilt the shame that they would feel because of societal um, judgment and, and and the stigma that goes along with addiction and that's kind of something that is really the last stages of, of dealing with a public health campaign like this you know that's really what you're starting to see is that you know People are, are coming to terms with it, they're comfortable talking about it, and, and they're starting to ask questions of how can we turn, the, turn this around. In fact, in your piece, you draw a parallel <coughs> um, to the HIV epidemic and AIDS and how that too many years ago, no one wanted to talk about it. And when someone passed, it wasn't mentioned, but there'd be the innuendos, And then all of a sudden, it didn't become a dirty word. And then people talked about it, and obviously, as we've seen, we've made major advancements in the treatment, let alone prevention of it. Definitely, and then that's part of the element of, of when more people are touched by a disease or touched by something, they're, they're more likely to be open to it. You know, when it's in your family, when it's in your neighborhood, when it's, when it's your friends that are affected by this, you're more likely to discuss it in a frank and honest discussion that really, uh, you know, is part of coming together to find a solution. And, and what that takes is, is going beyond the prejudice and, and, and the judgment and, and coming to to the terms of, of what they're talking about here when they're saying that, uh, you know, we're, we're fed up with this and uh, these, these parents who, who, who have a unique experience, nobody has the same experience as these parents. I mean, you can't, you can't really put it into the words. That's why the obituary kind of is a great uh, way for them to tell their stories because it's in their own words. You know, they get to have that last legacy discussion about their child or their loved one that they don't want people saying that they were just an addict that was no good, that they can actually shape you know, the story that's told because they're more than that. You know, as, as some of the parents say, they love their child, but they hated the addict. You know, it's that frustration. To that end, though, Dave, a, a lot of people choose that go through this tragic circumstance that they don't want to mention the addiction because they don't want that to be um, how their child is remembered at all because that was an ugly chapter uh, that took their child away. These people obviously went in a different direction. When you spoke to them, what did you find was the impetus that they said, you know what, um, this isn't who my kid was, but that also was who he was, and they chose to talk about it when so many still to this day choose not to. Yeah, I think one of the one of the kind of themes that you see when you're talking to a lot of these people, I've talked to, to a lot of these parents, and um, and one of the themes you'll see is that is that they don't want others to go through it too. I think that's an important part of this is that you know they want to be able to tell their their child's story and they want to be honest about it, and I think some of the turning points for them was that that they don't want others to have to go through that same thing that they did. So for them. They, find, they came to terms with, you know, talking to, a lot of it's talking with the treatment community. These people who have been in these struggles for years at a time, when they're talking 500 days sober, yep. you know, and that's after a years long struggle before that, they're talking about people who have been in the rehab centers. They've talked to treatment experts, so they know the language, they know what it's going to take to get through this, and they're the ones who are going to say, I can shape this in obituary so that my neighbors who might be going through this might come and talk to me. And that's what I hear a lot when I talk to these people who were the first ones to go through, and we were writing about this back in 2015, yep. and we talked to parents who, you know, a mother who said, once she put it out there, she was getting calls, you know, weekly, daily, from others who were saying, how do, how do you do it? How do, I, how do I get my kid out of this? Because that's all it took was somebody else saying, you're not alone in this battle. Um, what struck me in this was one of the parents says, every time I open up the paper and I look in the obituaries and I see an age, even if it's not in there or not, I know what happened to their kid. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's some of that veiled language that they can pick up on. And again, it's because it's their unique experience. You know, she sat down and had to write that obituary herself. So she knows what it takes to go into that. And she knows she probably had those same thoughts. Maybe I'll say he died unexpectedly or he died suddenly and then have a veiled reference to the recovery program that they went through in the end. And that's kind of what we also picked up in the, uh, the research into the database is that you can see some of those other references that are not directly attributing to addiction to the cause of death but really giving you a better idea of the scope of the epidemic by saying how many times did a, a, a died unexpectedly 
refer their donations to a re recovery program. And that's kind of putting the pieces together and getting the idea of, of what we're dealing with here as an epidemic. And that's what the experts will say is that they want to, they want to be able to, um, to quantify, you know, based on how many deaths there are, to clearly say this is how bad things have gotten. And at least that's one thing universally agreed. I've spoken to lawmakers, regardless of which party that they're in or which body that they're in, law enforcement, everyone in between, and they're all using that same word, epidemic. So, but I'm curious, Dave, they want to remove the stigma. They want to have a more transparent conversation. But they are the experts in many ways. They live through this. What do they think more than just sunlight being the best disinfectant, what do they think that they need? You and I have spoken uh, on a different level of, you know, Big Pharma, uh, by the way, and, and how there isn't responsibility, at least at the moment right now, in terms of who's putting a lot of the stuff on the shelves. Um, I'm not talking about heroin, but I am talking about opioids that are oftentimes hand in hand with this. What do they want to see happen that isn't happening now? Yeah, the, the, they, they want to see, the, you know, what, what of it, one element of this is they want to see the, the public health campaign get the funding that it deserves to actually turn the tide in this. And, and that's what you're seeing when you're seeing a lot of these counties, these, these states, these, these lawsuits against the pharmaceutical industries and the distributors that are involved in this. I mean, there's already been settlements in the past, but they're saying is that they need, they need to have the funding and the resources behind the treatment, you know, the, the access to inpatient beds, the, uh, the access to a medication-assisted treatment. You know, that's something that also is part of the stigma is that you, you won't see a lot of medication-assisted treatment clinics because for so long, people don't want that in their backyard. They, it's a, it's a you know, not in my backyard mentality of, I don't want the methadone clinic. I don't want the, the Vivitrol or the Suboxone clinic down the street from my house because I don't want people who are addicted to substances getting their, their medication-assisted treatment down the street from me and my, my family. And, and that's part of the idea of what you get when you start addressing stigma and started dealing with this as, as a, a disease. It's the same as having a, a, a medical clinic down the road from you also. You have to try and, try and get past that to access the tools that people are going to need for lifelong recovery. And then you start talking about, you know, dealing with the, the overprescription, the improper prescription of the opioids that, uh, that were part and integral to this drug crisis that we're facing now, that they have to be able to rein in the amount of pills that are out there that actually were involved in uh, the, the spreading of the addiction. Um, finally, one thing I think it's clear from both um, your reporting and Ray's piece, these parents are courageous, um, uh, and the grace that they've shown in, you know, in choosing to share. And I think, as you said, for reasons of looking out for other parents who are going through it now, that they're not only alone here, but um, that the best thing to do is to talk about it, because it's your neighbor, it's uh, uh, your relative, it's, it could be your kid. Um, but it took a lot of guts to do what they did. Oh, without a doubt. I mean, uh, you know, sitting in the living rooms with, uh, with these parents, you can see the the helplessness that they felt you know and, and there's the the bittersweet sense of relief that they had the struggle they had the good times but uh it's, it's something that you know nobody else you, you wouldn't know unless you've gone through it really it's that unique experience and these people you know there are so many that have have taken up the fight themselves they said that's it you know i've, I've lost my my loved one and i'm going to to be that element of change. I'm going to be that one who makes the change here because this, this shouldn't happen to other people. And, and that's, you know, another element of somebody being courageous. I mean, it's, it's difficult to grasp what that takes to, to pick up that type of tragedy and to, uh, to take action mm -hmm. like that. It's, it's, it's really difficult to grasp. Great reporting, Dave. Thank you. Thank you. Now, in Ray's piece you saw earlier, he spoke with Diane and Pete Ballesty. Their son died from an overdose four years ago. Diane paid tribute to her late son, Peter, in his obituary. Here she is. It says, Peter K. Ballesty, beloved son and brother, lost his battle with the disease of addiction Saturday morning at his soul and Congress. Graduated from Clarkstown North High School in 2000. Continued his studies at SUNY Oswego, learning a, earning a BA in creative writing in 2004. A tattoo artist by trade, he will be remembered for the myriad words he produced that will live on past him. Peter survived by his parents, Peter J, Diane W, sister Taryn, uh, Karen Ballasty Harrigan, brother-in-law John Harrigan, and loved ones. He will be remembered by all as a kind, soft-spoken soul who viewed life differently than most. His art, music, and writing 
reflected a kind nature. Befitting a man of peace. If there are no words to express the pain of those he leaves behind, there's only the thought that his personal struggle is now over. And he has found some peace. If after life's fitful fever, he sleeps well. Yes, he does. He does. The courage uh, those parents had to share that story with us and with you, uh, I really believe will help uh, other parents uh, in this crisis. And um, I thank them very much for that. We'll be right back.